This is a grandmother who is not accustomed to 21st century technology. <laughs> so when there's always a problem with the computer, I call someone much younger. <laughs> I'd like to begin first with a text as a prayer. Will you bow your heads, please? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's good to be back in Sacramento. This Central Valley was home to me for most of my childhood. Uh, when I was in college, my parents moved right here to Sacramento. And then for the next 30 years of my life, coming home meant coming to Sacramento. As I look around, things have changed a lot but in many ways it still feels like home. Now I live in a much smaller valley, way up north in the Walla Walla Valley, where I attended college back in the 60s. And yes, things have changed a lot there too, but in many ways it feels like home. This is why this subject, a church in change, is difficult for me, because I'm going to talk about home and some of the people that I know and love that lived there. Change, a definition, brings up many synonyms. Fluctuate, alter, mutate, shift, vary, morph, revolutionize, vamp, recalibrate, vacillate, tweak. Many different synonyms for the word change, different ways to describe different concepts. Change can be positive, it can be negative. Change may be sudden or oh so subtle that at times it's almost undetectable. Is there change happening in our church? Let me compare it to the little town I live in now. It's a small community made up of two little towns, College Place and Walla Walla, with a total population of about 50,000 people. Historically, it's always been a quiet, wheat-growing community but in recent years, many of the wheat fields have changed. The wheat fields have turned into vineyards, and along with the vineyards came over 200 wineries, which now creates not only a new landscape, but a seasonal tourist population of wine testers. Once our quiet farming community, now it's evolved into a wine tasting, wine tasting destination with tourists and all that comes with it. A bit like your own Napa Valley nearby, only on a rather smaller scale. But our Adventist community has undergone many changes too. It's a community made up of 13 different churches, some large, some very small, with Walla Walla University at the hub of much of the activity in our community. A few years ago, there were about 10,000 people that claimed to be Seventh-day Adventist. Currently, the census indicates that about half of those 10,000 are now former Adventists. Of the 5,000 which are still, quotes, on the books, only about 3,800 attend church. That's quite a change. Before moving back to Walla Walla, I had been studying with one friend of mine about the issues of spiritual formation and the emergent church. Only one friend because I couldn't find anyone else who was concerned or wanted to study or was aware or even cared. I looked forward to my move, not because I was leaving a friend, but because in this larger community, Adventist community, I might find others that I might study with on this subject. So during my first few weeks in College Place, I reconnected with some of my longtime California friends that I hadn't seen for many years. In fact, many of these friends were from Lodi Academy days. I went there back at the days when they had dormitories at Lodi. So that, that dates me completely. So we got together as 
friends from far and wide, for a Sabbath day's afternoon. As we caught up on old times, I asked one friend about her husband's new book. And I said, what's it called? And what's it about? She said, it's called Hunger. When I asked her what it was about, this was her response. Some people think it has a lot to do with Catholic stuff, but it really doesn't. She must have realized that I was puzzled by that description of the book, so she promised we could get together again and talk about it when her husband got back into the country. He was traveling in Europe at the time, teaching spiritual formation. Being retired and having some time on my hands, I went home, ordered a used copy online for 98 cents plus postage, and I read it. And here my concerns began. Soon after reading Hunger, I headed for the college place ABC to get to know the manager, a, a lady by the name of Carol, Carol Geisinger. I was searching for people who might be interested in studying about spiritual formation and emergent issues, uh, and most of the things that I was studying came from non-Adventist sources. But I had recently seen Carol's name on an online petition dealing with spiritual formation, and I thought the two of us might share a mutual interest in the subject, and we did. As we gradually got to know each other, I finally asked her, have you read the book Hunger? And is it on your shelves here at the ABC? She said, yes, it's on the shelf, but I, I haven't had a chance to read it. But she promised she would. And then she reached over right next to the cash register where she was working, and she handed me a book from that stack. And she said to me, Janet, you really need to read this book. This is the book by Rick Howard. It's called Omega Rebellion. If you really want to know more about spiritual formation, you need to read this book. So I bought it, and I read it. Finally, here was a book, The Omega Rebellion, in which I found information about spiritual formation written by a Seventh-day Adventist from his own personal testimony of having been in that element before he was a Christian experiencing going into these mystical situations. And he co corroborated all that with scripture and the spirit of prophecy and the concerns about it happening in our church. A few weeks later, I went back to the ABC. I had read Omega Rebellion and felt very well informed. Carol had read Hunger and she was concerned too. As we discussed the book Hunger, I asked her what later turned out to be a life-changing question. I said to Carol, can you in good conscience keep hunger on the shelves of this store? Her answer was not slow to come. It was immediate. She said, no, I can't. She took a courageous stand and the hunger books were removed from the ABC's bookshelves. A few days later, Dr. John Dibdahl, my friend's husband, and the author of the book, Hunger, stopped by at the ABC. Now, Dr. Dibdahl, to put it mildly, has credentials. Missionary, doctorate in ministry, theology professor, seminary professor, former university professor, author of five books, editor of the Andrews Bible, and probably much more that I don't know of. He's a very accomplished man. As he wandered into the ABC, he noticed that his book, Hunger, was not in sight, and he asked Carol where it was. She then courageously articulated her concerns about the book, Hunger, to its author directly. He patiently listened to her. He was kind and gracious, as Dr. Dibdahl always is. She even asked him if her actions, taking the book off the shelf, might affect her job. He kindly assured her that he would never do anything like that. Yet within a very few days of that conversation, Two Walla Walla University church pastors paid scolding visits to Carol's office. 
One, a female pastor, yelling at the top of her lungs, how dare you, a man with such credentials, causing another ABC employee to burst into tears. A few days later, another university church pastor hand-delivered a chastising letter from the entire Walla Walla University Church Board of Elders declaring Dibdoll's credentials and his authority and demanding that she put the book back on the shelves. Next, Carol's immediate supervisor at the conference ABC called her, and then the conference president got involved. An ultimatum was given to Carol Put the book back on the shelf, or you'll suffer the consequences. Through this whole difficult process, Carol's pastor, Pastor Mike Lambert, from the State Line Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is right on the border of Washington and Oregon, he was there in full support of her, not only as her pastor, but also supporting her concerns about the book and her conviction to remove it from the ABC bookshelves. Carol was convicted that the content of, her, of hunger was not biblical, and eventually she was forced to resign. Hunger was placed back on the shelves, and very soon after that, the book Omega Rebellion by Rick Howard was removed. Now that my friend's husband, John, was back in town, another Sabbath afternoon with friends was planned. And soon the discussion turned to my concerns about his book. And not being a theologian or a scholar or a debater, and especially in conversation with my friends, I determined only to ask questions. I, but I did ask particularly about the book's that he recommended at the end of his book. Those 84 different authors, some mystics, some Protestant theologians, but mostly emergent authors. And my question to him was this, why go to those sources when we have the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy? He responded, our students, speaking of college and seminary students, need to read from all of these sources in order to make up their own minds. Even though these books contain a combination of truth and error, teaching many mystical concepts and practices, he made no mention of teaching his students to discern truth from error, only that they needed to read on their own and make up their own minds. He only regretted publishing that list of sources after the fact because he had to deal with so many people who kept bothering him about concerns. Later, another friend asked him about the time that he spent at a Benedictine monastery a number of years ago. And he eagerly told how he had been able to share some of our Seventh-day Adventist beliefs, and particularly our health message with the monks. And then soberly he asked, do you really think people around here in Walla Walla uh, know about me going there? My unasked and unanswered question, because I remained silent on this, but that question would have been, why did he go to a Benedictine monastery on retreat? And when he got there, who was teaching whom? John continued talking about his book, Hunger, and the work he was doing at the present time uh, on the translations of hunger into Danish and into German. Some of those European pastors questioned him about his inclusion of the spiritual exercises that he advocated in his book. The exercises of breath prayer, contemplative prayer, which is a spiritual exercise that can lead one into the silence. Lectio Divina, a monastic practice started in the sixth century and currently advocated by the Catholic Church in their worldwide evangelism to bring all people back to the Mother Church. Centering prayer, sacred phrases. These are the spiritual exercises that the European pastors were concerned about. John sat back in his chair and commented, 
Oh, it only took about a half an hour to rewrite all those titles that they were concerned about. Then they were satisfied. So I asked him if he actually changed any of the spiritual exercises. No, no, he assured me. I just renamed the exercises. The spiritual exercises all remained the same. That's a really flexible change. I want to tell you about a very special lady and a very special friend of mine. At the Walla Walla University Church, a few weeks later, an 80-year-old lady named Lois Kind was listening to her pastor, Pastor Alex Bryan, as he introduced a new program in their church, Spiritual Formation. Lois suddenly sat up a bit straighter and listened much more carefully. You see, Lois was not your typical 80-year-old lady. She was a retired clinical psychologist, an occasional lecturer at the university, and a pro bono, pro bono counselor to anyone in need. Her last name, Kind, truly exemplified her Christian character. As she listened to her pastor, she was determined to do her own study about spiritual formation, its origin, its history. With a combined effort of several friends, Lois compiled an in-depth letter of concern to Alex Bryan, defining her study, urging him to reconsider the issue of spiritual formation and requesting a time to speak with him. She waited. There was no response. She called for an appointment, but he was too busy. For a month, still too busy. Two months. Not to be deterred, Lois resent her letter to her pastor, but he, she also added copies to the conference union division and general conference presidents, too. But there was no response from anyone. So Lois went back to doing her pro bono work and quietly sitting in the pew every Sabbath. Meanwhile, again, Pastor Mike Lambert pastor of the State Line Church, had the same kind of concerns about the introduction of spiritual formation at the University Church. And he decided to visit Alex Bryan's office to talk with him personally about the subject. And the emergent authors uh, from which he was constantly quoting, Bryan was casually dismissive of Lambert's concern and categorically denied that he was introducing spiritual formation to his congregation despite the fact that the whole community had seen his sermons on television. About two weeks later, a brand new brochure appeared. It was introduced to the university church telling all about a brand new program entitled Spiritual Development. It was inserted into each bulletin and sent to each home. Suddenly, spiritual formation, had now a new name, and it was called Spiritual Development. Do you see a pattern developing here? Yes. When confronted with difficulties, we flex, we change, we modify to keep people happy. That was a real quick change. More and more quotes appeared concerning the emergent church. Authors that were on the list called Encouraged Reading on the pastor's website. And many of these authors' names and quotes appeared on the screens in front of the church, showing names like Brian McLaren, Leonard Sweet, Richard Foster. You've heard some of these names just in the last hour, right? Brennan Manning, Dallas Willard, Rob Bell, Henry Nowen, all at the university church for our students to hear about. Some of these are admitted mystics, all non-Adventist, emergent church authors. Then came Alex Bryan's own book, The Green Corps Dream. It was named for the very first dream that Ellen Harmon had at the tender age of 15. This was not her first vision at 17. It was her first dream at age 15. The book that Alex Bryan wrote was called The Green Corps Dream the very same name as this dream that Ellen White had. The book that he wrote is now being advanced by the author 
as well as many church leaders, as the future vision and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But first, let me tell you about the original dream that Ellen Harmon had, the one that was recorded in early writings, pages 79 to 81. In her dream, Ellen was led up a stairway to meet Jesus. Here's an abbreviated version of the dream in her own words. In a moment, I stood before Jesus. There was no mistaking that beautiful countenance. Such a radiant expression of benevolence and majesty could belong to no other. As his gaze rested upon me, I knew at once that he was acquainted with every circumstance of my life and all my inner thoughts and feelings. I tried to shield my face from his gaze, feeling unable to endure his searching eyes, but he drew near to me with a smile. And laying his hand upon my head, he said, Fear not. Just two words. But when they come from Christ, that should mean something. Fear not. The sound of his sweet voice thrilled my heart with a happiness I had never experienced. As she was guided from Christ's presence, she was given a green cord to hold close to her heart. And when she wanted to see Jesus, she was to stretch it out to its utmost. She was also warned not to keep it coiled up for very long, should it become knotted and difficult to straighten. In other words, we need to stay in touch with Jesus. Ellen White later wrote on page 81 of Early Writings what that dream meant to her. That should be very significant, I think. This dream, she said, gave me hope. The green cord represented faith to my mind and the beauty and simplicity of trusting in God. It dawned on my benighted soul. This beautiful green cord dream dramatically revealed God's very personal loving care for young Ellen with his promise through the green cord to be close to her whenever she needed him. With his omniscient knowledge of the future, Jesus knew she needed this personal reassurance. His simple two-word message of fear not for the life that she would lead in service to him. But now back to this new Green Cord Dream, the book written by Alex Bryan. Because the author chose to name his book after Ellen G. White's dream, you would expect some reference to her role in the establishment of our church and it's the inspired writing she received to be mentioned, at least in the book. Instead, a very few pages, uh, in the very few pages where he does reference her, his language is subtly diminishing. The author chooses to marginalize her by calling her a delight, as one might call a little child, calling her inspirational yet never affirming her as inspired. Most concerning is his definition of her dream, where he called it a mystical experience. Those of us, though, that have heard him speak at the university church do not find his choice of words unusual, for he has referred to Ellen White from his pulpit at the university in the past as a 19th century mystic. From the Green Cord Dream, the author's perception of Adventist past. A quote, the stream of Adventism is fed by the teardrops of disappointment. The Adventist movement was born in failure rather than success, error rather than truth, darkness rather than light, and sorrow rather than joy. Brian, in his own words, calls God a failure. He calls God in error. He calls God producing things in darkness as he led out in the establishment of his remnant church. Instead of affirming God's leading in the establishment of his church, the author has chosen to diminish both God's leading and his church through this first page statement that he makes. Mrs. White speaks very clearly of the 1844 disappointment. 
Great Controversy, 374. The purposes of God were being accomplished. He was testing the hearts of those who professed to be waiting for his appearing. Could the veil separating the visible word, world have been swept back, the angels would have been seen drawing close to these steadfast souls and shielding them from the shafts of Satan. Yes, God did allow sorrow, a devastating sorrow, but it was a short-lived sorrow in that through God's leading, his most faithful people were compelled to return to the Bible, to restudy God's word, gradually discovering the present truth that God was revealing in his time, in his way. Brian, by attempting to sustain the disappointment, is now attempting to establish the need for radical change in our church today. Another quote from page 18 in the Green Cord Dream. Adventism is not peculiar or special because of our Sabbath keeping, vegetarian cuisine, or remnant claims. Adventism's uniqueness is found at the historical roots, Jesus. Well, if you look at history, it is replete with hundreds of denominations, cults, sects, and offshoots, all claiming the name of Jesus. Claiming Jesus does not make anyone unique because most religions claim Jesus. Jesus has always been at the core of our beliefs. But the, establish, the, the Sabbath establishes an inextricable covenant with God and his remnant people and should not be relegated to the back seat with that kind of a statement. The Sabbath does make us peculiar. Praise the Lord. Our health message is unique. Our remnant claim is justified. We must not minimize these historical truths, the present truths upon which the pillars of our faith are founded. Reading on in the Green Cord Dream, the book makes no mention of those historical present truths, those five S's that we all know the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the sanctuary, the spirit of prophecy, the second coming. Also, there's no mention in the Green Cord Dream about the three angels' message or the gospel commission. Is that a complete gospel? Is this where we should be going? Look below the, on, on the screen where it says below the book cover, purported to be the future vision and mission of the church. That's what the author says this book is for. That's what many of our leaders throughout our church believe this book is for. Another quick quote. Sabbath is for worship, yet Jesus doesn't emphasize this aspect of the day. Sabbath is for rest, yet Jesus doesn't emphasize that either. Do these two statements affirm this essential present truth? The Sabbath, or does it diminish it? That's my question to you. Affirm or diminish? Is this change we can accept? One last quote from the Green Cord Dream. Worshiping God with our bodies is about pleasure and experiencing physicality. Creationists believe God created human flesh. The body is good. And just to prove it, God came down in the person of Jesus. Jesus came down to prove that the body is good. I thought he came down to save us from our sins. Amen. A final quote from the last page of the Green Cord Dream. Brian's conclusion summing up his message Dust-dry 21st century Adventists can immerse themselves in the teardrops of the great disappointment. We can cultivate a simple, primal, powerful, fundamental longing to be with Jesus. We can bathe ourselves in our denomination in an insati deep, insatiable desire to be with Jesus. Now, by describing today's Adventists as dust dry, in need of immersion, 
He implies that we are a church currently without Jesus. Jesus was at the core of our beginning, and he will be the core of us for eternity. So why should we today immerse ourselves in teardrops of the disappointment? That was over 170 years ago. The disappointment is over. The tears are gone. We do not need to cultivate a primal, insatiable desire. We do not need to bathe in the temptations or, or the, the teardrops of disappointment. Our job is not to bask and bathe. We have work to do. We are commissioned by Christ to share his message of hope, not bathe in teardrops of disappointment. Readers familiar with Ellen White's writings will not discover a unity with Brian's Green Corps Dream concept, but rather a subtle, constant reiteration of ideas disparaging the historical and present-day Seventh-day Adventist Church, diminishing Bible doctrine, disdaining the need for continued Bible study, and promoting an ecumenical rather than evangelistic approach to the world. Adopting Ellen's Green Core Dream as the title of this book and her minimal mention of that in his text appears to have been used for the single person purpose of adding credibility to the author's thesis for change rather than Ellen White's message of hope. Ellen White's Green Core Dream and Alex Bryan's The Green Core Dream have few common threads of any color. Should you think I'm the only one with these concerns about this book, here's a portion of the book review written by Gerhard Fandel, a member of the Biblical, Institute, Biblical Research Institute. And I quote, The Green Core Dream is a book that will primarily appeal to young Adventists, and therein lies the danger. While seasoned Adventists who know the Adventist message and what it's all about can take this book in their stride, young, impressionable Adventists will come away from this book with a skewed picture of what Adventism is all about. Yes, Jesus needs to be the center of our teaching. Amen? Yes. And our lives. But who is this Jesus? And what is his message? While the Green Corps dream contains some excellent material, particularly on the issue of violence, health, and the need to put Jesus first, the overall impression of the book conveys to the church and its teachings. It's not favorable. Is this really what our young people need? More importantly, let's get the facts and our theology straight before we do. Meanwhile, back at Lois's house, Lois is still waiting for, an, for a call, for an appointment, some kind of response from her pastor to her letter. And then a friend of hers decided she wanted to share this letter just to one person. And inadvertently, I promise you it was inadvertent. <laughs> I didn't send it, but I know who did. <laughs> inadvertently, it went viral. Suddenly, everyone knew about Lois's letter. Within a few weeks, she was deluged with emails, all having read of her concerns from people all over the United States, from all around the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, South America, need almost, 20, almost 1,200 responses, all in support of her concerns about spiritual formation in our church. All but one. There was one letter, one caustic letter from a Dr. Chuck Scriven. In it, he advised, in part, in the end, we may all agree that spiritual formation is demonic, but for the moment, it is a live option, and it deserves your respect. Well. I don't have to say anything more after that, I don't think. 1,200 letters of affirmation, one negative. Now the pressure began for Lois. 
Now her pastor, Pastor Alex Bryan, wanted to talk with her. Now he was at her door, demanding a retraction. And he did not come alone. For weeks on end, two and three times each week, pastors, scholars, authors, theologians, elders, and Walla Walla has many, many, many of each, stopped by to visit with Lois. Providentially, whenever they came, announced or unannounced, she was never alone. Her friends were constantly there to support her, along with one lone pastor, Pastor Mike Lambert. One pastor in that valley would stand up for Carol Geisinger, for Lois Kind, and for more. Some of the visitors were angry. Others were gracious. But during one visit, Pastor Brian informed Lois that she was being relieved of her church job. Now, Lois loved people. She was a greeter at one of the great big six doors that enters into the University Church Narthex. And Lois, smiling and welcoming with a happy Sabbath, would hand out bulletins once a month. But now, because of her letter of concern, her influence was no longer acceptable. Her response to the continuous pressure was always, it's okay, they can't hurt me, God is in control. But the pressure continued. In support of Alex Bryan, our university president, John McVeigh, who supports spiritual formation, made a very emphatic announcement to the entire university faculty and staff about the letter and the whole issue of spiritual formation. His mandate to his entire staff was, do not get involved. One professor confided to me that the tone of the announcement sounded, quote, very much like a threat. Another professor immediately sought out Lois Kahn's house, knocked on her door, got to know her well, and after hearing her concerns, supported her concerns, and does so to this day. Students reported professors mocking Lois and her letter to other students, describing her as the crazy grandma down the street. Despite the mockery, disparagement, and disdain heaped upon her, Lois Kind remained in her front row pew at the Walla Walla University Church, undeterred and faithful to the church she loved. But the pressure continued. Dave Thomas, chairman of the theology department, quickly sent off a letter to Spectrum magazine for their winter 2012 edition. An article entitled, The Great Spiritual Formation Kerfuffle. Kerfuffle? You know what that is? It's a delightful old British word defined as a fuss, a commotion, a hubbub, a ruckus. And in this article, Thomas referenced by name the concerns of a certain lowest kind of college place about spiritual formation. And in the end, he summed it all up by saying this. There is a very great fear that spiritual formation apostasy is taking over Adventism. But I don't see it. However, our general conference president's first address to our church, and Steve just referenced that a little while ago, Elder Wilson counseled, stay away from non-biblical spiritual disciplines or methods of spiritual formation that are rooted in mysticism, such as contemplative prayer, centering prayer, the emerging church movement in which they are promoted. Look within the Seventh-day Adventist church to find methods and programs that are based on solid biblical principles and the great controversy theme. Two different leaders. Two messages. It takes study to figure it out, doesn't it? And where do we study? To the Bible. Soon Dave Thomas began visiting other local churches, affirming spiritual formation. In in one of those talks that I heard personally in one of our local churches, 
He also presented a very unusual description of Satan. He described him as just a tired old toothless lion who is weary of the fight and can now do nothing more than gum us. To say Satan is tired and toothless is to tell us to relax. To say that Satan can do no more than gum us implies that we are in no danger. On one hand, Thomas describes spiritual formation as merely a kerfuffle, not a problem. And then on the other hand, he doesn't seem to think that Satan is much of a problem either. Again, back to last Sabbath at annual council, our general conference president counseled us. Speaking of Satan, he is as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. He is after everyone through direct physical attacks, spiritual complacency, congregational division, denominational dissension, personal unbelief, or Laodicean apathy. We need to lean completely on Jesus, on his holy word, and on the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Who do we listen to? Which leader? You have to decide. Alex Bryan left Walla Walla University Church briefly to become the president of Kettering College in Ohio. But after a six-month tenure, he returned, bringing with him the headquarters of the One Project. Has anyone ever heard of the One Project? Yes. Some of you have? OK. The One Project is an organization formed about four years ago by five pastor slash chaplain friends who felt the need to focus more on Jesus. The group grew quickly, and now the One Project events are held across the United States, in Australia, in Europe, with their target group appearing to be the young adults of our church. Along the way, it has developed a multitude of sponsorships and support within our church, from educational institutions to conferences, to unions, to the NAD, and many other entities. There are several different phrases that they've used to promote their efforts. Just Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus all. They seem compelling. So I decided it was time to observe an event firsthand. In February of this year, the elevators opened on Seattle's Weston Hotel on the fourth floor. And a friend and I, who had gone to Seattle, were greeted with the sound of live rock music coming from our own homegrown Seventh-day Adventist rock performers. They rocked our world before, after, and in between each activity for the next two days. Present truth was the advertised theme. Since this was an Adventist gathering, I assumed present truth would still mean those unique truths that we talked about, those five S's, um, the ones that were revealed back there by our founding fathers. I've never known anything else to be called present truth. All of these framed within the context of the three angels' message, but never assumed. Advertising is one thing, reality is another. As the event began, I began to hear a strange truth. I did not hear a Seventh-day Adventist present truth. I heard an emergent truth with a nebulous message that focuses primarily on conversation and dialogue with the group consensus determining your direction. So we'll talk about it and then decide our truth among the group. I heard people disillusioned with an established church structure, seeking to deconstruct traditional worship. I heard the importance of a simple narrative, or the scripture, needing to be interpreted by current culture, not letting the scriptures interpret itself, but we do it within the concept of, of culture. And our culture is constantly changing. I heard an advocacy for a social gospel with no emphasis on evangelism, I did not hear a Seventh-day Adventist present truth. I heard an emergent truth. Recalibration. 
This was a term used at this event for roundtable discussions, which occurred after each one of the 13 different speakers during these two days. Recalibration was directed by trained facilitators, one at each table, who ensured that the conversation and dialogue never veered away from the subject of just Jesus all. Several times I tried to push the envelope a little further to discuss how our lives might change after accepting Jesus, the new heart that Christ gives us, how it changes our lives, how we want to go into even more diligent study of the scriptures, and how we cannot help but share the gospel. Each time I was verbally pushed back from that kind of talk, we can only talk about just Jesus. To me, and this is only my opinion, it seemed like justification without ever moving on to sanctification. During the course of that two-day event, several speakers did speak very eloquently about the love of Jesus and the need for a closer relationship with him, while others pre presented the emergent message. Let me tell you about just a few. One of the very specially invited guests is the speaker, author, named Leonard Sweet. You can see his impressive, impressive credentials up there on the screen. He is one of the leading thought leaders of the emergent church today. As a visiting distinguished professor at George Fox University, he was the mentor and professor to four out of the five One Project founders during their doctoral studies. Speaking about the churches of today, Sweet says in his book, Soul Tsunami, Reinvent yourself, talking about the church, for the 20th century, or die. Is that change? That's change. This is the same kind of change advocated by One Project leaders. A few years ago, Sweet was encouraged to read the chapter in the great controversy called Modern Revivals, where Ellen White strongly warns against false revivals in the last days. Sweet's response to this chapter was this. Those are the kinds of revivals I believe in. Those are the kinds of revivals I preach. And yet, this man has been teaching our One Project leaders. Ellen White says this in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 371. There is to be no compromise with those who make void the law of God. It is not safe to rely upon them as counselors. You are not to look to the world in order to learn what you shall write and publish or what you shall speak. Let your words, and this is quoting now from 2 Peter 1, 16, let all your words testify. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. Can we testify to that? I hope so. The introduction to the whole event was given, a very brief introduction, was given by Javeth de Oliveira. He was a co-founder of the One Project. He gave the welcome and set for me a very unsettling tone with these few statements. It's time to change our minds. It's okay to turn around 180 degrees. The more we know, the more uncertain we become. Nothing is etched in stone. Did you see those tablets that Steve held up here? Yes. There is something etched in stone, Amen. and it does not change. Amen. And to hear someone who is leading our youth say nothing is etched in stone, that causes me concern. He continued with a definition of present truth. The more we know, the more we, come, we become a fixed, lifeless religion. What do we throw away? We must grow together, recalibrate, which is another word for change. We must focus only on Jesus. Is that present truth? Here's Tim Gillespie, also a One Project founder, who presented another definition of present truth, even more disturbing than the last. This is his definition, three words. 
Present truth is perpetuating, changing theology. Is this biblical? And how does one perpetuate that change? To remain fresh, we must be fed by many streams. Streams must flow both ways. Others must feed our truth. We must go beyond our denomination. Again, is this biblical? Is this Seventh-day Adventist theology? This is emergent church theology, and I dare say it comes from books of another order. One more speaker, and this is Alex Bryan, co-founder of The One Project. He told the story of a very distraught woman who had recently attended a revelation ceremony, a revelation seminar, pardon me. She had become very fearful for the future of all the horrible beasts and the Antichrist and the evil that might confront her during the last day events. Brian, in his attempt to ease what he called her paranoia, suggested to her and to all of us as a church that we should not go around scaring people, frightening them with the fearful views about the last days. It makes people paranoid. It makes people think our church is paranoid. So instead of scaring people, talking about the beasts and future devastation, that's revelation, right? He assured her, we should just focus on Jesus all. But Mrs. White makes a statement in Testimonies to Ministers, page 116, about that same issue. As we draw near to this world's history, end of this world's history, the prophecies related to the last days especially demand our study. The last book of the New Testament scriptures, that's Revelation, is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse not for not making the revelation their study. Can we follow leaders with blinded minds? At the end of the event, the event advertised as present truth and with a goal to encourage just Jesus or Jesus all, there was a final charge given to each attendee. In it, not a word was said about present truth. Not a word was said about Jesus. Each person was charged to, and I quote, go home and change your church. The concept of a deeper relationship with Jesus advanced by the One Project sounds good. However, commingled is an urging to an undefined change which leads away from the scriptures and toward a world church view. With the One Project now headquartered in Walla Walla, all university students are encouraged to become involved. But the One Project is now reaching out even further, not just to university students, but now to academy students. And this is where it gets personal. You see, I have three wonderful grandchildren. My older grandson and his friends were approached last year at Walla Walla Valley Academy to become part of the One Project, to join with their group. Two more of my grandchildren may follow here, may follow him to that academy someday, but at, I doubt it at this point. You see, I have personally listened to what they preach, and I've felt the spirit that they generate. Now, you may be wondering about those bears on the screen, a mother bear and her cubs. Have you, any of you ever heard the expression, a mother bear, a protective mother is called a mother bear? Well, when we grandmothers become, when we mothers become grandmothers, we become grizzly bears. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there grandmothers here? 
and grandfathers are just as ferocious. They stand even taller when they stand. Well, this Grandma Grizzly is standing up. I want my grandchildren to be taught a biblical gospel, a complete Seventh-day Adventist gospel, which uplifts Christ and his remnant church, not a watered-down, neutralized, recalibrated theology that suggestively leads them away from the truths of God into an emergent worldview. Look at this chart. You read the title up there? A global plan for the future, a management structure. It shows the one project leaders placed at all levels of leadership throughout the entire structure of our world church. This is a plan to take one project theology to our entire Adventist world. Now I have to talk about Mike Lambert again. He is a man dear to my heart. He is my pastor. And he speaks Bible truth, always. He was unafraid to stand up for Carol Geisinger. He was unafraid to defend Lois Kind. He has spoken up against the book Hunger, The One Project, Spiritual Formation, The Emergent Church, and The Green Core Dream. And because of his standing up, on these many issues, the road to and from our conference office is very well traveled. As Pastor Mike is often summoned by the conference president, two of them, in fact, have summoned him at different times, and they're not pleased when he speaks out concerning these issues. Whenever he is reprimanded, he has a pat response that he always gives to them. He says this, show me where I'm not in accordance with the Bible, and I will humbly apologize to my congregation. He's one pastor in 13 churches, and many of those churches have more than one pastor, so there are many more pastors involved. One pastor in the Walla Walla Valley has stood to his feet, but he doesn't just preach from the pulpit. His focus is also on the youth. The state line youth Sabbath school is regularly taught by Pastor Mike, and another church member, Ron Duffield, who's the author of Return of the Latter Rain. Some of you may recognize that book. Together, they have developed a DVD about spiritual formation and the emergent church for the youth, teaching them about the history of it, its terminology, its leaders, diminishing theology, its ecumenical goals, and how to discern truth, comparing all with the Bible. We have been given a biblical imperative to study, and now it is even more essential. I never thought I would ever say this about my church in my life, but today we cannot always count on hearing the full gospel of Jesus Christ from every Adventist pulpit, and it pains me to say that, but I'm afraid it's true. I've been speaking you, to you about a few events which have occurred in my community around me, among friends, for the last several years, but it's not just a local concern. Our entire church is being targeted in many ways by subtle and at times overt change. Only a few have had the courage to stand up and speak out. One lost her job. Others have been disparaged. Some, in concern for their jobs and their reputations, remain silent. And others simply choose to ignore the warning signs. Review and Herald, September 9, 1873, Mrs. White said this, If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is of doing nothing in case of emergency. Indifference or neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. Can we remain silent? Should we remain silent? No. Whether perceived or not, we are in a religious crisis. 
whether it's called spiritual formation, spiritual discipline, emergent church, or the new and up-and-coming term some of you may have heard called the convergent church, which is totally ecumenical. Call it what you will. It's not biblical. It's gradual. It's subtle. And its ultimate goal is ecumenical. That means eliminating a remnant. And it's on its way to a church near you. Some of you may cons be concerned that I have spoken too candidly about people by name. And my answer to that is this. The Matthew 18 text that some cite has to do with personal, private concerns. None of this is personal. This is not about individual people or personalities. We, in this weekend, are responding to public presentations of Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. Many in our midst, from the pulpit and from the printed page, have publicly presented a fluctuating and changing theology for many years with no public response. 1 Timothy 5.20, them that sin rebuke before all, that others may fear. Isaiah 8.20, unto the law and unto the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. According to this text, if a preacher speaking from a pulpit presents truth one moment and error the next, there is no light in them. If an author prints truth on one page and error on the next, there is no light in them. Where I live in the Walla Walla Valley, the community has changed from a simple farming community to a sophisticated wine tasting destination. But what of our Adventist communities? What of our wineskins? Are they new and fresh? Do they contain the pure, undiluted Word of God? Or have we begun sipping aged wine from decaying wineskins of the Desert Fathers, the mystics, the emergents? I began with one word, and that was changed. That was change. And it had many definitions. But let me give you another word that's a little bit more graphic. The word is erosion. A word, another word, demonstrating change. Erosion ultimately destroys the original. Often today, now think about this one for a minute, often today we look at scenes in nature. You see what's on the screen? Looks beautiful, unique, special. Scenes in nature that are eroded and find a semblance of beauty in them. Yet we are not truly seeing the original, God's true creation, what God originally attended intended for us to appreciate. My prayer is that we do not allow the uniqueness, the excitement, the novelty of a newly advocated change to cause erosion of verified biblical truth. A group consensus of conversation and dialogue must not govern truth. Let the scriptures only be your truth. Again, Isaiah 8.20 unto the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. Carve this text in your heart and verify, personally verify all that you see and hear from God's word. Then stand up and speak without fear in defense of God's word. Trust his word. His word must not be changed. Thank you. Thank you.